Good evening and welcome to TDM Talk Show. I'm your host, Kelsey Wilhelm. Our guest tonight is Tri Tharyat, outgoing Consul General of the Republic of Indonesia in Hong Kong and Macau. We're joined by the Consul General at an interesting time for the Indonesian community, both inside and outside the country, with national and parliamentary elections being held. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Kelsey. Now, unfortunately, we have a little bit of a, a bad timing in that we don't yet know, the, at the time of our speaking now, we don't yet know the, the results of the election. Well, um, the result will be coming out officially in two and a half months because then there are certain procedures taken by the uh, authorities back in Indonesia. Yes. But I'm, I'm very fortunate that I have voted for my choice. So it's a sign of that Indonesians who have voted by putting their uh, finger into the ink as the proof that they have uh, exercised their rights. Yeah. Now we have a very interesting um, election, especially for the, the leadership now. We have almost a repeat of what was happening in 2014. Yes. We have Joko Widodo, uh, who has now proven himself with the term in office and could potentially be facing a second and final five-year term going up against uh, Prabowo Subianto. Um, now, is this... Uh, in terms of going forward, do you, th do you expect that under either leader we will see a major shift in, in, in any of the policy? Well, through their five times debate, uh, of course people may judge then uh, that the two candidates, they have their own agendas towards the future of Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And of course the two uh, ideas are promising and it's up to the people then to pick uh, the best uh, candidate for them. As far as the radical changes of the policy, I don't really see that the two candidates may bring uh, significant uh, changes rather than they want to improve the livelihood of Indonesians through their own uh, ways and their own ideas. And of course, to also make the uh, Indonesian welfare is higher than today. They offer a number of programs uh, that perhaps to attract people to pick uh, their policies as the best policies, uh, but I'm personally convinced that those ideas are for the betterment of Indonesian uh, people's livelihood. Now, uh, Indonesia is one of the largest democracies in the world, and in terms of the Consul General, what are they doing to inspire and encourage people to express their right to vote? I have prepared the election for Indonesians living in Macau and in Hong Kong since one and a half years ago. So when we tried to evaluate what happened in the previous election, and I read reports, I heard uh, people complaining about this, about that in the previous uh, election day. And then I also spoke with the previous committees mm -hmm. who happened to be still in Hong Kong and Macau and to learn uh, from, uh, from them on how we improve the quality of the service provided by the Indonesian Consulate General. So then I pick up uh, new ideas that this year uh, we allocated three venues in Hong Kong and one venue in Macau, indoor facilities. Mm -hmm. So then I approached the authorities of Macau SAR government and also Hong Kong SAR government and I was so grateful that they provided us this very uh, excellent facility. Here in Macau, we were given the opportunity to use the TAPSEC Sports Center. Some, uh, the uh, center, Sports Center is very convenient for Indonesians living in Macau. It's very accessible and a very good facility. Mm -hmm. So back in 2014, we had all these election uh, activities in outdoor facility. So that I was so afraid, of course, uh, if something, you know, weather was not that friendly mm -hmm. and it happened that the last Sunday it was raining the whole day. Mm -hmm. So I was so glad that we decided to use the indoor facilities. And I'm very thankful with the uh, assistance of the Macau authorities uh, for the successful event of Election Day in Macau. So we saw that despite the rain and a very good choice on the indoor <laughs> facilities, there was a very large turnout. Do you happen yes. to know how many voters have already turned out? Well, I have seen a significant increase compared to the 2014 election. So last Sunday, there were 2,161 voters turned out. All right. And uh, it, we saw an increase to 30% compared to voters in 2014. Uh, they totaled 
1568 voters. So there were some interesting factors on how we see the increase of the voters. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, today is the social media daily activities. Uh, then secondly, I would see the political consciousness of Indonesians are getting higher and higher. Mm -hmm. Then thirdly, perhaps the rivalry is getting more heated. Of course, in the positive way that they really wanted to exercise their voting rights in that very day. And in Macau, we do not have the uh, postal voting system, unlike in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. so that all uh, voters, eligible voters, turn out in the polling stations. I was a peaceful and enjoy, a joyful day for them uh, because they waited for about two hours or so, mm -hmm. but they enjoyed it because they really felt that it's once in five years and they really wanted to exercise their political rights uh, guaranteed by Indonesian constitution for the future of Indonesia. Now we see that within Macau there are around um, 5,500 more or less uh, registered workers from Indonesia. Uh, were you, and this is almost half of that number, Yes. were you expecting such a high turnout? Well, it was not the case because prior to the actual day we received uh, less confirmed voters. Mm -hmm. So which means then on that very day, uh, more people came mm -hmm. uh, to vote. So this also happened in Hong Kong. Those registered voters was around basically uh, 50,000, but okay. in that very day, around uh, more than 60,000 uh, uh, show up and we are still counting for the final numbers now. Mm -hmm. But it once again uh, shown how the their political interests are uh, uh, getting higher and higher and also uh, the political consciousness I would say is, is getting higher too. So they really uh, they will be really willing to exercise their foot on that very day. Now in regards to the, the number of people in Hong Kong, number of Indonesian nationals in Hong Kong, uh, 60,000, that's about similar to the, the difference in the population size also between Macau and, and Hong Kong. Uh, oh, it's a big difference. Yes, yes. 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 Uh, we expected to have uh, around 50,000 voters, but in that very day, uh, we already received around 25,000 um, uh, ballots uh, sent by mail, okay. and plus around 35,000 turnout in the polling stations. So it's extremely um, uh, significant increase compared to last year. Because last year, I mean, last election, we had around 24,000 voters. Mm -hmm. So, which means almost 120% increase in Hong Kong. Yeah. Now, we, we catch you at a very interesting time because the elections are happening, but also you're going to have a change for yourself as well. Yes. After being in, in the role in Hong Kong and Macau since, um, since September of 2016, mm -hmm. you're now going to be moving on. But in terms of your time in Macau and, and Hong Kong, you've been here and you've seen some very interesting developments. Uh, what, is there anything that's stood out to you so far? Oh yeah, when I arrived, we saw great challenges on how providing a better public service for our nationals and our guests, in particular on how we uh, better serve uh, for their passports, their consular documents, uh, processes, and other things that in my view took too long. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an example, how uh, when I arrived that Indonesians, they needed around 15 days uh, to renew their passports. Uh, something that I felt it was a bit too long and is not good for servicing our people. So then today I'm very happy to tell you that they can renew their passport only in three days. There have been major changes. There have been major changes than I have, uh, that I have undertaken. So I introduced the IT uh, system and of course they only need to come once instead of three times for renewing of their passports processes. So I'm glad that it is warmly welcomed by my people here in Hong Kong and Macau. And also uh, it helped them in making sure that they know exactly when they have to come to the consulate uh, to do their uh, uh, renewal of the passports. That is one thing. Uh, second thing also I was glad that I launched what we call the Indonesian 
Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong and soon mm -hmm. in Macau. Uh, that is now in the final stage of establishment uh, and is in the process of being registered. So these institutions, uh, I hope, will be the bridge between the interests of Indonesia's economy, uh, investment and trade with those counterparts in Hong Kong and Macau. So recently we also learned about the new initiative called Greater Bay Area, mm -hmm. something that I am very sure uh, is a good opportunity for Indonesian business people to capture uh, because it really offers ample op of opportunities for them to invest, to trade more, and to use this kind of uh, initiative and incentives. Now you yourself have, have quite a bit of experience. You're not, you've not only been based out of Jakarta, but you've also been based out of New York and Paris as well. Right. What does that past experience contribute towards working for the Indonesian community in a place as large as Hong Kong? Honestly, I haven't served in those places having a huge number of Indonesians. So Hong Kong was my first, first experience uh, of managing and uh, providing uh, protection for a large number of Indonesians. Mm -hmm. So I started from the scratch on how to deal with the, uh, the protection issue. Mm -hmm. And it is really in line with the president's uh, priority. One of his uh, priorities uh, was to protect Indonesian uh, nationals abroad mm -hmm. and to ensure that the states are present in their pop in their uh, overseas nationals. Mm -hmm. So it really put me in a very challenging situation. Mm -hmm. So Hong Kong is a place for the, the fourth largest place for Indonesians living overseas after Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So which means there are more uh, uh, focus in the protection issue and pro providing a better service. Speaking of Macau, we, as you mentioned, we have 5,500 uh, 5, Indonesians living in Macau in February this year. Also provides, an, uh, also provides another challenge for me. Mm -hmm. uh, because first of all, almost 60% of them living in Macau are domestic helpers. Mm -hmm. And we need to work more with Macau authorities in providing uh, better protection and how we put everything in paper. So we are working closely with Macau authorities, with uh, also Indonesian counterparts on how we improve the quality of Indonesian uh, protection uh, in Macau. Now in particular to, for that issue, there have been multiple cases in, in Hong Kong more so than, than Macau. Yeah possibly just because of scale, in which these people do need protection. Um, so how does someone, how do you go about shaping policy when an Indonesian national comes up to you and says, I have had a bad experience and I need help? So we introduced the hotline numbers mm -hmm. that, was, that is basically open for 24 hours for any complaints or reports. And then we open up the office on Sundays mm -hmm. because Sundays are mainly the day that the Indonesian workers in Hong Kong and Macau chose for their holidays. Mm -hmm. So then we also renovated a room so that they can have more privacy when they come to the consulate to report their cases. I saw increases on reported cases mm -hmm. uh, in the last two years, which means again, I am glad that they have bravery to come to the consulate to report whatever cases that they may have. So Hong Kong consulates uh, for Indonesia is one of the largest consulate in uh, abroad. And we have, I have 19 diplomatic staff that help helping me and two thirds of them are helping Indonesians. So providing uh, public service for Indonesians. So in my office, I have the consul for police uh, uh, affairs uh, attorney generals, immigration, uh, labor, mm -hmm. as well as trade so and customs. So they help me a lot on providing better services for Indonesians. Cases are being handled, of course, in uh, different ways and mm -hmm. in parallel manner. So my office has a regular talk uh, with the Hong Kong authorities for labor issues, 
we meet once in three months, so during which we can bring all issues to discuss and to find solutions. I created what we call the triangular uh, uh, talk between the consulate, the representatives of the agencies and representatives of the uh, labor. Mm -hmm. So it was found very effective in how we improve the quality of innocence working in Hong Kong. Other thing that also we call agents, we call the employers when necessary to come to the consulate and find solutions. Speaking of IT, we also establish the new tracking system so that I and my colleagues can find the right way a real time on where the cases is being handled at, as of that very day. So it helps us a lot in tracking all the cases because some cases of course, a very high profile cases, mm -hmm. uh, and the attention of Indonesian media towards whatever happened in Hong Kong in Macau are extremely high. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep ourselves updated on all the cases. Mm -hmm. And speaking of numbers, I have also seen an uh, increased number of reported cases. Mm -hmm. So in 2017, we had around 600 cases. 2018, we have 1,300 reported cases. Okay. So it again poses bigger challenge for us on how to address those uh, uh, cases. So, so far, honestly, we may not be able yet to settle all the reported cases, but I'm glad that 60% of the reported cases uh, are uh, solved already. Okay. Do you find that there's a difference in between Hong Kong and Macau in, in terms of the types of cases reported? Yes. Well, first of all, basically, we have significant or substantive different. Mm -hmm. First of all, in Hong Kong, I do have all databases of Indonesian workers working in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. But in Macau, the system is different. Yes. So in the Macau laws and regulations do not oblige us to put all the uh, Indonesians to report to us. Mm -hmm. So there are no kind of uh, approval process of Indonesians uh, of uh, contracts made between Indonesians mm -hmm. and the locals, unlike in Hong Kong, that we have to endorse all of these uh, working contracts. Uh, so in Macau, the system is different. That puts us even in a more challenging situation. So uh, we have a small office here uh, that serve our uh, nationals. That opens twice a week on Wednesdays and Sundays, uh, basically to help all the cases uh, reported uh, to us and also at the same time to provide service for the renewal of the passports. And in addition to that, we also rent an apartment for the shelter of Indonesians in distress. Mm -hmm. So we help them uh, shelter for a couple of days or some weeks before their departure back to Indonesia. Speaking of cases, there are different, ca different types of reported cases, mm -hmm. yes. In Macau, mostly the reported cases were on overstayers mm -hmm. and then on the uh, victims of the fake uh, job offered. Yes. And also in the holding of the documents. Uh, unlike in Hong Kong, that are mostly uh, cases concerning the uh, overcharging issues. So we don't really find that in, in Macau. Uh, but then what is unfortunately going uh, in terms of the number is the cases of the people who, who were deceived by these uh, bogus uh, jobs mm -hmm. offered them. Now, in terms of other protections, aside from the ones which are reported to you, I understand that you are a fan of having a minimum wage for people who are working. Yes. In, um, in Macau. In Macau, what I understand that there is an indicative minimum wage, and perhaps this is something that the government of Macau and Indonesia can talk together, sit together, and how we provide not really a standard, but at least the minimum wage that the foreign uh, domestic helpers should be uh, guaranteed. So we came up with the amount of 6,000, of course, that includes all the accommodations and the meals mm -hmm. that we believe it is something that is 
uh, reasonable for Indonesians living in Macau. Now, Macau is a very different situation from Hong Kong, in particular yes. to foreign domestic helpers, because Hong Kong law obliges that the employer also provide housing for the, or that the, the foreign domestic helper live with the employer. That's something that's different in right. Macau. Would that be a beneficial policy for uh, foreign domestic helpers from Indonesia and Macau? It's hard to tell because some prefers living in, some prefers living, uh, staying out, but the laws are something that we have to obey. Mm -hmm. So in Hong Kong, it is very strict rules that they have to live in, but in Macau, they still open up the options. So the options is up to them, but I was told that almost all Indonesian domestic helpers, they stay out. So perhaps they are happier to stay out. I, I'm not sure, uh, but of course, that is probably the win-win solution for the employers and employees uh, when they do not live in at the same place. So this law that we have to obey, uh, to obey, uh, to obey uh, but what is more pressing, I, in my view, is perhaps the standard contract that is provided uh, yes. for this purpose. Mm -hmm. So the standard contract should include all the rights and obligations of employers and employees and all related uh, actions that the two parties should uh, take into account. So we are willing really to see the standard contract in, in place and then perhaps we may consider of putting Macau in the list of uh, uh, a region that be part of the Indonesian domestic helpers to be uh, employed. For your information, Macau is not on the list mm -hmm. yet because then we have to ensure that all their uh, rights are protected, mm -hmm. uh, including one of uh, them is the standardized contract mm -hmm. that the two sides will sign in it and of course all rights and obligations of the employers and the employees. So overall I have seen uh, a better situation for the nations uh, working in Macau, although there are still some homeworks that we need to work on. What about one of the main important things which you're working with Peduli Sehat in Hong Kong, uh, you're working with Caritas right. in Macau, right. but healthcare, what do you, how, how often are people covered by healthcare? This is also a very challenging situation for me because health issue, especially for uh, women uh, living outside of, uh, far away from their families and living for uh, work, a very hard work, uh, I would say six days in a week mm -hmm. with perhaps less rest. And I was really touched by the fact that in my first few months, there were reported cases of the death of Indonesians because of the illness, mm -hmm. be they the breast cancer, cervical cancer, and other things that mostly related to the uh, female uh, health. So then I came with an idea of providing uh, free clinics for, for them, mm -hmm. free medical checkup for them. We started with, my, uh, with our own budget, mm -hmm. and then later on it became more and more popular that people kept waiting for the next uh, occasions. So since my arrival, I have organized 15, one, five mm -hmm. uh, free medical checkup, engaging many uh, stakeholders who have similar concern with us. And the result was not that promising. Of course, okay. I cannot tell you the figures, but there were a number, uh, quite a high number of Indonesians detected with the breast cancers, yeah. cervical cancer, and so on and so forth. And I, my office so far, I would say, have served almost 3,000 Indonesians uh, through this uh, free medical checkup. So we had uh, once in Macau, and on that two days, uh, we also served around 200 Indonesians living in Macau. Mm -hmm. So we are planning to continue doing the same program 
because I'm happy that those who were unfortunately detected, we can mm -hmm. follow it up with the authorities in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So some of them were even given free of charge uh, by some uh, Hong Kong institu uh, authorities or institutions or charities mm -hmm. uh, because we understand that cost-wise it is not also uh, affordable for them. So we also find a way how to help them in terms of their health situation because I personally believe that health, health issue is something that we should really uh, focus on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In regards to the Macau authorities, have, has there been any offer on the part of the Macau authorities in regards to medical help? Until now, we are still working with the Macau authorities mm -hmm. because uh, we have spoken with them and they're trying to find the best way. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that in Hong Kong, uh, they have established the Hong Kong Breast Cancer Foundation, for example. Mm -hmm. They also uh, have some uh, funding for those in need mm -hmm. uh, that helps uh, patients uh, with some subsidies and yeah. so on and so forth. So for Macau, this is something that we may continue working. So I'm very optimistic that uh, what we have been doing and will do consistently will also uh, be considered by the Macau authorities. In regards to, uh, as you are an outgoing Consul General and you're set to become the next ambassador to Kuwait, yes. um, in regards to things that you have started during your time here in Hong Kong and Macau, uh, do you see those going forward with your predecessor? Are there any roadblocks to that happening? We, uh, I personally established some systems, mm -hmm. so which means whoever replaces me just continue that system mm -hmm. that will make his or her life easier, theoretically. And of course, uh, there are still uh, some rooms open for improvement. Mm -hmm. So perhaps communications and talking and listening uh, with more people will really enhance you know, ways of uh, improving the quality of the service. So I'm not saying that what I have been doing are perfect. Uh, of course, there are still some issues that uh, need to be improved, some uh, facilities should be improved, uh, but I am very happy that what I have been uh, doing have been also rewarded by some institutions. So for example, my office received the ISO for quality mm -hmm. service and also for other uh, services that I'm glad to contribute uh, towards Indonesian people in Macau. And of course this ideas is uh, still uh, deep in my mind and in my heart that I'm thinking of doing the same way in Kuwait in my next assignment. Now you've already been welcomed um, in January the 7th you were inaugurated. Uh, so going to Kuwait, how large is the Indonesian pop population in Kuwait? Wow, it's comparably small, very small comp uh, compared to uh, Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and it's slightly larger than our nationals here in Macau. Mm -hmm. So back in 2009, we had 78,000 Indonesians living in Kuwait. Mm -hmm. But then that year, we introduced the moratorium policy of yes. not sending the domestic Indonesian domestic helpers to Kuwait. Mm -hmm. Then the number reduced it drastically. Mm -hmm. So today we have around 3,000 Indonesians domestic helpers remaining in uh, Kuwait and the number of Indonesian skilled workers are improving from day to day. So we have more than uh, 5,000 Indonesian skilled workers in uh, Kuwait. So in total it's almost 8,000 now mm -hmm. uh, with different composition than before. So today we have two thirds of them are skilled workers and uh, one third are domestic helpers. But in terms of servicing our public, we have a similar standard mm -hmm. in all missions abroad. Uh, that Foreign Affairs Ministry, they provided all the IT system to help in missions abroad, uh, what we call the uh, protect, uh, pro innocent protection uh, portal mm -hmm. and uh, safe travel uh, portal and so on and so forth that are basically uh, useful for Indonesians living everywhere in uh, overseas. Are you expecting any large changes from your lifestyle in Hong Kong and Macau? Oh yes, yeah, certainly the new tradition, the new mm. customs that I have to adapt myself. 
I'm happy this is going to be my fifth assignment in the different region. I serve in Africa, Europe, United States, and also Asia, and this time around will be in the Middle East. So I'm so excited to going there and to serving my people there and to serving my country. And I cannot tell you now how I feel about it, but uh, of course I see uh, many uh, interesting challenges in front of me. Now you, you leave this role and, and assume that role on, on May 1st. Uh, can you tell us who your predecessor is going to be here in Hong Kong and Macau? Uh, the, you mean my successor? Yes, your successor, my apologies. Um, my successor is still being in the final process mm -hmm. and it will be designated as soon as possible. But as you know, today uh, all the innocent governments are still busy in yes. uh, doing the general elections, perhaps in a few weeks it will be finalized. All right. Well, yes, very busy times now with the elections. Thank you very much for taking time. My pleasure, Kelsey, and good luck. Good luck for your next assignment Thank you well. so much. That's all for this evening. Thank you for watching. We'll be back next week with more TDM Talk Show. Thank you. Good night.